why one needs this particular certification or this particular why one needs to know about this certification or this particular technology is what we are going to see in today's webinar and i will show some of some demos okay uh, about uh, on microsoft fabric okay how to start the trial how to move ahead uh, all of this is what we are going to do and along with this we are going to have three breaks Okay, one is going to be a mini break once I come uh, at around 11.30 or 12 or 11.15. Okay, 11.15, 11.30, we'll have one break. And then we will have a lunch break, which will be a one hour. Okay, and then another break around four o'clock for tea, coffee. Okay, so this is what we will be doing uh, for the entire day. And by 5.15, we should be done so that we can... Uh, so that Archie can complete, I mean, uh, end the day for the webinar and y'all can, uh, because it's a weekend, so we will try and wrap it up as fast as possible. So now moving with, uh, let's start with today's topic. Just before we go in depth, okay, I will like to give you an overview about the topic first what it uh, what are we going to uh, see what are the kind of modules that are there okay uh, for who is this certification and etc we will be talking about so i'll just share my screen So today's topic is about DP 600, which is nothing but a certification. If you want to be a Microsoft Fabric Analytics Engineer, okay, this is like a next level in the data analytics domain. If you're looking for data analysis, okay, this is the particular tool that now you should learn. Okay, it is uh, what this tool is. We will see in some time. So let me just do a quick course introduction. Okay, so just uh, I think Archie has already explained the benefits. Just a quick introduction about myself. I am Manasi Shahane and I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer. I've been working with Synergetics for quite a few years and my domain of training is data and AI. I, I work in the practice of data and AI. So whatever trainings are pertaining to data and AI, I hand over and these are the certifications I have been doing. Then. Um, the pre there's a prerequisite to this course. Okay, uh, people uh, should already uh, know what is uh, certain data services on Azure. Okay, you should know the Azure environment and the data services on the Azure environment. For example, Databricks, uh, Data Factory, da Synapse Analytics. Okay, Power BI. These are some of the services that a person or an individual who is looking for who is looking to get into Microsoft Fabric or learn Microsoft Fabric should already know or the knowledge that person should already have. Okay, because this certification or this training does not talk about those things. It is assumed that you know. So I hope you all have knowledge about data breaks. You all have knowledge about the services I just listed down. So you all can just put a yes, no. Okay, because uh, you all will understand like whether to continue in this webinar or not. Okay. So we can like skip this slide. It's not required. So like I said, you need to know. Uh, like I said, this is for y'all. So y'all need to know basics about the Azure data services. You need to know them. Otherwise, because it is more or less the same. Okay. Once you know those services, okay, from scratch, you know Microsoft Fabric. Okay, it's a very easy tool then to work with. So this, these are the modules that are there in this particular certification so there are around four modules and we'll be doing a quick overview of them and i will be doing some of the um i'll be doing some demos uh in this particular module that is there 
So this training or this particular certification is divided into four days. It is a four day training. OK, it is covering around. You can see this is the breakup of the training. OK. Uh, yeah, so it's something that we can't cover in a day. You require four days to learn the particular uh, service that is there. And then, of course, we are going to provide you with the. So I will be sharing the material from where you can study. OK, these particular uh, DP 600 modules. So the learn website and the link I will be sharing with you all towards the end where to schedule the exam uh, from where can you practice do the labs. OK, all that information I will be sharing throughout this particular. Um, certificate. I mean, during this webinar. And then of course we are giving you a complimentary badge. OK, which RG will share the details soon in the chat, which you have to redeem and you can share this particular badge with your colleagues, with your uh, on your LinkedIn profile. OK, uh, once you redeem it. OK, and then after that, after taking today's webinar, learning, doing, practicing the labs on your own, studying the material that I share, you can definitely try and give the certification. OK, and I will talk you about it. Where can you schedule this particular certification that is there? So let's start with module one. OK, let's understand what is Microsoft Fabric first. Give me a minute. So let's understand from where did the Microsoft Fabric or from where did Microsoft Fabric? Let's understand from where Microsoft Fabric came. OK, what were the challenges before? Challenges before Microsoft Fabric came into picture. OK, like I told you all, you all need to know uh, the basic Azure data services. It's a prerequisite of this particular training or of learning Microsoft Fabric. You need to know Azure Databricks. You need to know Azure Data Factory. You need to know as your Synapse. Synapse is something that you should know if you want to go in depth of Microsoft Fabric. So Synapse Analytics. Then of course, uh, the concepts of data warehousing is something that you need to know, but we will be seeing what is data warehouse and we will be touching on the concept of it. OK, soon. And of course, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, Microsoft Fabric DP 600, OK, in terms of DP 600, I think this is. Sufficient to know. OK, now let's understand the challenges. OK, when we talk about these data services, OK, whether it's data factory or it is data breaks or it is synapse analytics. OK, these services, OK, these services are platform as a service. OK, they are platform as a service or short form we all know is PaaS. OK, it is a platform as a service, which means that you have to configure your own application. You have to put in the data. OK, just what does the cloud service provider handle is nothing but the. Um, the OS that is the operating system, what kind of operating system to use? What should be the size of the disk? What should be the memory size, etc. OK, all the networking aspects, all the storage aspects at the data center level. OK, the physical infrastructure that is required is all taken care by your cloud service provider. So this is what is basically platform as a service. Now when you when I say platform as a service generally, okay, now let's take 
the example of data factory okay and let's say i i want to create or i'm configuring the data factory service on azure okay so whenever we uh, create a data factory service okay we the first thing that we create is something called as a workspace correct we need to create something called as a workspace then let's say we are talking about uh, then we have to configure the region where you want to deploy this service where you want this service to be created correct this is the region you should have something called as a subscription valid subscription correct then you should have the money you should have the cost which comes uh, along with your subscription correct but you should have money in your subscription in order to deploy this particular service correct so now let's say i want to integrate okay i want to integrate just one minute Okay, let's say I want to integrate Databricks and I want to integrate Data Factory. Okay, it's called ADF in short form. Let's say I want to integrate Databricks and Data Factory. So what happens, okay, when we are trying to integrate these multiple services, okay, let's say not just Databricks or Data Factory, or you want to connect Databricks with Power BI, you want to connect uh, Synapse with Databricks, or you want to connect all these services, Okay, the first challenge, like I mentioned, is that they are all pass. Okay, and even though, okay, they are on the same cloud platform. Okay, when I say, when we are talking about Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Breaks, Azure Synapse Analytics, Azure is the cloud, right? It is the same cloud platform that you, all these services you will find. So what happens here is for every service, okay, for every service you have to configure a separate workspace you have to create a separate workspace like i told you you want to create you want to work with data breaks and data factory and you want to integrate them use them in your data analytics solution okay the challenge is that they are pass. That means you need to have a, you need to have a separate workspace for every service. That means Databricks will require its own workspace. Data Factory will require its own workspace. Okay, and then once you have created these workspace, the challenge that next let's say comes is the compute. Compute meaning the physical resources. that are required in order to run these service on you to use these services right you need to why do you why do you use databricks or why do you use data factory because you want to do etl you want to do big data analysis you want to do you want to process your data right you like i told you all this is these are data services so you want to naturally process your data correct so if i have to do that you require physical you require a physical compute okay like you require memory you require input outputs correct all these things are going to be required by you okay so you need to configure them you need to decide how much you need how much you don't need correct so that you have to separately do it again okay you have to configure separate compute for each service separate compute for each service. Then the next challenge is that now let's say we are like I told you this, we are working, in, let's say we are working in an enterprise and I'm pretty sure all of y'all come from some enterprise, right? You work in a company, you work in an organization, correct? That's now let's say you, <clears throat> even though you are in an organization, okay? Um, let's say you, 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 we know that in different, like in the enterprises, we have different departments. We have a sales department. We have a marketing department. We have um, HR department. We have multiple such departments, right? So let's say I want to, you know, give access to the data bricks 
okay but i want to give very limited access to the let's say hr people but full access to the marketing department let's say some access to the uh, sales department or no access to the uh, to the hr department because they are not technical people why should they come and access these services okay so what happens here is that for every service because they are pass so i'll actually remove this because this is the reason Okay, I'll make this one. Okay, since they are all pass, okay, again, the challenge here is that you need to configure security, identity, and access separately. For each service for Databricks, I need to configure different security, different identities. I need to give different accesses. I need to give so that people, okay, so that people from the other department don't come and access that service. Okay, you restrict that access. You stop the access. Okay, you decide whom to give what access. So that is in terms of Databricks. Then separately, you have to do it for the data factory as well. Okay, let's say for data factory, you have some other identity and access. You don't want to give sales department and the HR department access to it. Okay, so these are things that you need to separately configure. Okay, you for individual services that you need in your analytical solution. Okay, so this is another challenge. Then the fourth thing is data governance. We all know data governance is very critical nowadays, correct? We need to know where our data, what kind of regulations, okay, for compliance, okay, regulations, policy management, okay, for policies. We, we know that data is something that is very critical, okay? It needs to be governed. Who is using, how? How is the data being used? Why is it being used like that? What kind of policy should I apply so that my data is protected? My, I am achieving privacy. Okay, how do I do that? That is done through data governance. Now, for every service, now imagine you have 10, I mean, you have data breaks, you have uh, data factory, you have Power BI in one of your analytical solutions. How are you going to manage them? How are you going to govern the data that is going across three different services? Okay, they will all be required. You'll have to individually again configure the data governance, correct? For data breaks, let's say you don't want these standards, okay? But for data factory, there are some other standards. So you need to configure them separately, right? Why can't I have something that I apply on all the services and it is ap applicable to everyone? Okay. So you need to individual, even though you have to apply the same compliance strategy, the same compliance regulations or policies, okay, across data breaks, data factory, it is very time consuming also. All these things, the next thing is that this is very time consuming. Okay, it is very time consuming. So you have to individually go. You have to individually go into the service and you have to configure them. OK, don't you think it will become very time consuming? Correct. You have to go data breaks, apply the same uh, security, apply the same governance, go to data factory, apply the same things, manage the compute, create the compute. OK, whom to give what access, decide the identity IAM, do the IAM, that is identity access management. OK, for every different service in your analytical solution. OK, so these were the challenges. I would rather place this here. So these are the challenges. Okay, another challenge is the cost. Not every service in Azure is of the same cost. Okay, your data factory, your data break, your Power BI, Power BI depends like service will be charged, but Power BI desktop is free. But the thing is, these services have no common ground for charge for the cost. 
okay you need a subscription you need a or you go with the pay as you go model correct you go with this particular subscription then or you take the enterprise level subscription for azure which is very expensive right which is very expensive and you don't know for which service how much cost will be deducted it depends on the region where you deploy like east us doesn't cost much but australia costs a lot for the same service okay so these are the things that you need to manage when you are talking about the data services on azure these were the challenges that came in so this is what microsoft picked up it said hey this is not right okay people who are working in an enterprise okay they are facing challenges they are facing problem one second they are facing challenges they are facing struggle to integrate all these services even though they are on the same platform why because of these reasons because of these reasons okay so what did microsoft say okay let's not uh, allow this let's overcome these challenges okay let's bring everything on one platform okay and that one platform is called as microsoft fabric okay we all know what is m365 or office 365 correct that is microsoft 365 or office 365 correct we all know we have been using it okay what is this this is nothing but a saas tool okay saas solution for all the work that we need to do in terms of uh, like we can use word in when we want to create presentations okay we can use ppts microsoft ppt we want to manage or do some accounting stuff finance stuff we use the excel okay manage or keep records we use or uh, excel then we want to interact with people okay over call over um, create groups interact within the organization we use the microsoft teams correct so what are those those are nothing but services in your microsoft 365 or office 365 correct it is something that you uh that you have worked with those are the different services you have not created or configured those services similar to your azure data services or any service on azure whether it's a database so a database or a storage account or a vm or anything it's not something that you are configuring okay it is something that is given to you all you need is a appropriate license correct all you need is an appropriate license so based on the license that you have you can use the microsoft 365 so it is either something that is taken by the organization so we all get a domain name okay which is nothing but are related to our organization correct like mine is synergetics-india.com so this is nothing but the domain name that is there correct that is the domain name that we get so whenever you associate yourself to an or enterprise okay generally my m365 or office 365 something that is used by enterprises by organizations correct and once you are in an organization you can easily use the services that are there that is word excel ppt uh, microsoft teams outlook okay you can use why because your enterprise has purchased a license and based on the license you can use those services so microsoft thought let's do the same thing with our data services that we could achieve with office 365 or m365 let's do the exact same thing but for the data services so microsoft fabric okay microsoft fabric is also a saas tool okay for your data for your azure data services 
Meaning, what does what has this done? You want to use Databricks, you want to use Data Factory, you want to use uh, Synapse Analytics, you want to use Power BI, you want to do data warehousing. Name any data service and you can do that without the challenge of integrating those services. It has, sorry, it has been brought on one platform. OK, it had, though they were on the same platform, but still we had the challenges of integrating them. They said, let's not do that. Let's in, bring it on one platform and offer it to people. OK, as a SaaS solution, as a SaaS service, OK, software as a service. We all know what is software as a service. We don't need to configure the application. OK, we don't need to decide in which region I need to create the application. We don't need to decide the workspace name. OK, you don't kind of. But here you do need to create a workspace. I will talk about it uh, once the once the time comes. OK, we know that in M365, what you just need is a license. OK, you just you go with a free license, which will have some validity of 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. I don't know the exact validity, but it will have some validity to it. Correct. Based on the license that you have. OK, generally the licenses that are there is E3 or E5. I'm, I don't know about this in depth. You can go and study about it. Okay. The same license. OK, the same concept it has picked up. It has said, OK, you can I will give you the data services in the form of SAS. OK, all you need is a license. OK, and a domain name. OK, all you need is a license and a domain name. Domain name meaning you should be a part of an enterprise. OK, you should. Have an enterprise. Or an organizational. ID. OK, this is what you should have in order to work with Microsoft Fabric. So Microsoft Fabric is nothing but a unified. Platform. For. Databricks. Data Factory. Synapse. Data Warehouse. OK, all these services There are more services as well, but in DP 600, these are the services that you will be seeing in depth. OK, so it is nothing but a accumulation or an amalgamation. You can just name it. It's a mix of all these services in the form of SaaS, OK, which is offered to you on one single platform. So that is what is Microsoft Fabric. OK, and Microsoft Fabric is something that can be used. OK, now who can use it? OK. So what have they done basically in Microsoft Fabric is that they have picked up these challenges. OK, they have picked up the Azure data services and to that they have applied the concept of Microsoft 365. OK, they have picked up. They said let's apply all these services. OK, in the form how we have Word, how we have Excel, how we have PowerPoint. Let's do that with Databricks. Let's do that with Data Factory. Let's do that with Synapse and let's do that with even Power BI. OK, so this is what basically in simple terms is Microsoft Fabric. OK, now who can use it? For who is Microsoft Fabric developed or for whom uh, they should uh, or who can use it basically is if you are a. In simple terms, a data professional. If you are a thorough data professional now, data professionals, sorry, it should be data professionals. Now, what are who are the data professionals? Let's say you are a data engineer. You can use this. 
let's say you are a data analyst you can use it or let's say you are a data scientist you can use this particular tool that is there so if you belong to the data practice, you are a data professional, whether an engineer or data scientist or a data analyst, for you, this tool is there. Okay, this is the tool that you can use. Okay, now what is the advantage of using this tool? Why did Microsoft come up with such a tool? So, like I told you all, the primary reason is that so that people, okay, within the same organization, Okay, within you just give me one minute, guys. Yeah, so within the same organization, people should be able to share, people should be able to share or yeah, the employees within the same organization should be able to share their work Okay, without having multiple workspaces, without configuring multiple, um, without configuring multiple security, identity, access, and along with that, okay, people should be able to share data across departments. So this is what basically Microsoft Fabric aims at. So when we say within the same organization, so what Microsoft Fabric has done is that they say you can create one workspace, one compute, okay? Have one copy of your data, okay? And based on this, you can create You can create your data analytics solution. Let's say your data analytics solution, like I said, requires Databricks, requires Data Factory, requires Power BI. Instead of creating separate workspaces, configuring separate compute, okay, managing the security, managing the identity, managing the governance separately, okay, you all can do one thing is that just configure them okay create them within the same workspace create them using one compute and also along with that you can have one copy of data. So this concept, why, what is it? I will talk about it when the time comes, okay? But this is what is basically the background behind Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so Microsoft Fabric is what this is and who can use it, we have seen. It requires a license, okay? In order to work with Microsoft Fabric, you need a E3 or an E5 license. You should be a part of an organization, okay? Because the primary reason why this has been built is because for the enterprises, okay? It has been developed. It has been developed solely for Microsoft solely for the enterprises that are there, okay? Just give me one minute, sorry, there's some...
Okay, so let's just uh, walk through some presentation and then I will, yeah. Uh, we talked about the challenges that are there. What are the common challenges that are faced? Uh, then we saw what is the definition of Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so it's I told you an all-in-one solution, okay, data analytics solution that is there. The other definition that you can say is something like this. I told you this is a SaaS platform. So, so this is nothing. The, these are the definitions for Microsoft Fabric. And we will be seeing much more than this. Okay. I will show you all the Fabric portal. I will show you all how to access the Fabric portal. Okay. All of that I will be talking about. Then I told you it is nothing but a uh, single or unified platform for all these services that are there okay so dp600 does not talk about real time analytics doesn't talk about power bi doesn't talk about much of data science and the data activator it focuses on the first three topics that is data factory that is your data integration how you can get it etl elt okay data engineering that is your warehousing sorry lake houses not warehousing and uh, spark related stuff okay and your uh, data factory data warehouses pertaining to the data warehousing concepts that are there okay so this is what basically is looked in uh, dp600 so the first three services is what dp600 covers then to that, you have DP 601, 602, 603, which are one one day trainings, okay, which cover all the data science aspects, covers Power BI, covers real time analytics, okay. Uh, individually, it, it gets covered over there. Then we talked about who, who is or for whom is Microsoft Fabric. So you can see the categorization over here, the classification into different. Um, for different users, you can see the uh, how they are being divided. So if you're a data engineer, what kind of services can you use? Okay. If you're a data scientist, what kind of services can you use on Microsoft Fabric? And if you are... Uh, so Databricks is a part of uh, Microsoft Fabric through a feature called as Notebooks. Okay. So in Databricks also, we have only Notebooks where you write the code. So Microsoft Fabric has that feature and it is part of the data engineering uh, service. So it definitely has. So it is in the form of notebooks, which is similar to your Databricks. Correct? In Databricks also, you are working with notebooks. So here also, you will have notebooks to work with. Okay, so this is a categorization according to the data domain that is that you are belonging to. So let's say you are a data engineer. So what kind of services can you use? If you're a data analyst, what kind of services can you use is all specified over here. Now, coming to the most important concept, and that is the architecture of Microsoft Fabric. So when I told you like in the beginning that Microsoft Fabric is something that is can only be used if you're a part of an organization. OK, if you belong to an organization, that means an enterprise and you have something called as a domain name. OK, so we all know when we when we are working in an enterprise, OK, we are nothing but a tenant in the. We are nothing but a tenant to a particular or to that particular organization, right? 
the moment we leave the organization we will not be able to use the domain name like you will not be able to use your enterprise id that has been given to you correct this is what we will not be able to use once you leave the organization so it's the same thing over here as well okay exact same concept has been picked up you have to be a part of an organization and to that organization we all know there is a administrator who manages these tenants that are there who to give what access okay when you like log into the uh, organ when you i mean join the organization you get an email id right uh, you have been given an email id and along with that email id you get a password which is given to you by your administrator so the administrator is responsible okay the administrator is responsible to give you what kind of access okay to configure the sip password or not so if you remember like when you join the organization along with the domain name along with your email id you get a password a first login password and then after that you have to go and reset the password correct this is what you get and if in case you forget the password or you um, have to reset your password you can't do that your administrator will have to do it right he or she will do it correct so the same thing is being applied over here exactly the same thing okay here now there can be two ways in which you can architect it one way is if you see the re the way retail company a has done it what they have done they have they have kind of taken a subscription or microsoft fabric subscription or a microsoft fabric license for the entire organization how our organizations work okay they take a license for the entire organization whether it's an e3 license e5 license okay and within the license then you can allocate the number of tenants okay you can segregate the way a uh, retail company a has done okay they have taken it for the entire organization and within that they have assigned something called as capacities which we will see in some time okay and within that capacity they have allocated workspaces they have given uh, the opportunity to the tenants okay so the tenant is the same as your as your tenant that is there the azure active directory or now it is called as microsoft entra id okay the exact same concept has been applied here so you need to be a tenant of the subscription okay so once your organization has purchased the license the subscription to use microsoft fabric so it can either be as a whole okay as your entire organization and then once you have once you have taken that tenant for the entire organization then you can like let's say create workspaces within that allocate capacities okay within the workspaces and then you can start using the microsoft fabric portal the other approach that you can take okay is let's say instead of taking the uh, entire organizational tenant okay in let's say for my instead of me taking for the entire synergetics company okay i can go according to the departments i can divide or i can take subscriptions or i can take tenants okay i can purchase the license according to the department wise and give different domain names according to the department okay now what do i mean by this so let's say marketing department will have a separate marketing domain name so let's say it can be synergetic marketing in .com or it could be let's say for finance i want to give a different domain name so it will be synergeticsfinance.com okay any domain name you can give but it will be specific to your department so you can go with that approach as well and uh, if you take that approach then you can further divide and give workspaces allocate capacities allocate tenants okay within the uh, departmental tenants that are there so these are the two approaches that is you can take when you are working with the microsoft fabric portal and the general approach i mean the common approach i would say is generally this approach that is 
that is being taken by retail company A. Okay, so this is how you can, you know, work with or architect your Microsoft Fabric. So you you take a tenant. Now, what is a tenant? Okay, let's look at the terminologies that are there that I just spoke about. So a tenant, like I said, is nothing but similar to the Microsoft Entra ID. Like you have a subscription in the Azure portal. And to that subscription, you are a tenant. You have a domain name associated to it. Like in Azure, we can have a B2B, we can have a B2C tenant, correct? Similarly, uh, here, but it will only be B2B because like I told you, Microsoft Fabric is, do is domain specific. It is uh, something that is only or can be used by the enterprises, okay? So uh, that is uh, important here. Okay, so you are you need to be a part of the organization. Okay, and your organization will decide similar to M365. Okay, exactly the same concept has been picked up. So that is what is a tenant. It is nothing but an instance of the subscription. Okay, similar, like we say, you know, instant instance of the subscription or tenant of yeah, instance of the subscription. Okay, and along with the tenant, you get a domain name. And that domain name is nothing but your company name. Okay. If you don't have or you don't belong to an organization, you can definitely create one in uh, using um, nowadays Microsoft is giving this E5. Something that they are running is called as the developer program. Okay, where you get a E5 license for around 90 days. Okay, so in case you are not a part of the, um, in, in case you are not part of any organization, you can definitely try. Uh, you can take a E5 license and you will get it for 90 days and you can use the Microsoft Fabric portal. Okay, so this you can do. The other term is called as capacity. Now, what is capacity? So as the name says, so a capacity is something that resides or stays within your tenant. So you need, once you are a tenant, so every tenant will be given some capacity. Now, capacity is nothing but the physical resources that you require because you will be running the data services, whether it's a data factory, whether it's a data breaks, or sorry, notebooks, or data warehousing, something or the other you will be doing. Correct. Where does that stay? It will stay within the capacity. So if you have to run those things, it needs a compute and that is nothing but your capacity. OK, so along with a tenant, you do get a capacity and this capacity is determined by the license that you purchase. OK, so there are different Microsoft Fabric licenses, which I will talk in the next slide. OK. Uh, what kind of licenses are there? Similar to your Microsoft 365 licenses, E3, E5, then I think premium license, like I, I, I'm not sure, AD premium, I, I am not from that domain, so I, I really don't know whichever license I, I, I know. I'm just telling you all that is E3, E5, all those licenses you can have within your uh, the same licenses you can use even for Microsoft 365, I'm sorry, for Microsoft Fabric as well. OK, so based on the license that you have, you can configure the, that you will get a capacity associated to associated with it. OK, so within that capacity, then you can create something called as a workspace. Now, what is a workspace? A workspace is like a container, like in Azure, we resource groups, correct? We all know what is a resource group where we can put in all our uh, work that we have done, okay, all the things that we require, the different resources that we require in one container. The same thing is your workspace, okay, where you can put in a data pipeline, you can put in a data warehouse, you can put in a lake house, you can work with notebooks, etc. any service that you want inside the same workspace, inside the same container. OK, it will have all the services that you have created at one single location, and that is called as a workspace. 
Okay, so that is nothing but a workspace. And whenever you uh, create a, uh, a or you log into your Microsoft Fabric portal, there is a default workspace that gets created and it is called as my workspace. So this is a personal workspace that you get. Just one minute. This is a personal workspace that gets created where you can keep like when you go to the off when you go to your office, right? In the office, you have your own allocated space, correct? Where you keep your own stuff, your laptop, your bag, your tiffin, your bottle, and etc. Okay. Where you don't allow others to come in and sit with you, like a personal space, a defined space. Let's say you just want to keep things. Uh, you, whatever you have created, you just want to keep it within, like you want to keep it as a you know, personal thing. So that is why there is a personal workspace that has been given to you and it is called as Microsoft. So it's called as my workspace. Okay, this is a default one. So whenever you log into a Microsoft Fabric portal, you will get this. Okay, so here you can't share things with people. Okay, it's something that is personal to you. You can create another workspace called as a shared workspace where you can share the share your work with your colleagues. Okay, with your teammates on the same project if you all are working. Okay, you like how in an office generally the tendency is that teams should sit together sales team, marketing team, or people who are working on a say on, on the same project, they tend to sit together. Correct. So it's the same thing with your workspace. Okay. Let's say you are you're working on a single project. Okay. You can share the things at one single location by creating a shared workspace and by giving people access to that workspace so that they can put in the work that they have done, upload the work that they have done. Okay. And sharing, accessibility, managing, all those things get much easier. Okay, so that is what is a workspace. The next term is something called as a experience. Now, what is a experience? So when I told you all that Microsoft Fabric is a mix of or is a unified platform or is an amalgamation of the data services on Azure. Okay, you, you will find the data breaks, you will find data warehouse, you will get data engineering, you will get data factory, you will get data science, you will get real time analytics, you will get Power BI, etc. All these things that I talked about is called as a experience in Fabric. Okay, it's called as an experience in Microsoft Fabric. So what does this experience mean? Let's say you are working on data engineering. Okay, so that is an experience in Microsoft Fabric. That means you're experiencing the data engineering tool of Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so this is what is termed as an experience in Microsoft Fabric. Next term is called as an item. Now, what is an item? So now I told you about the experiences like you have data engineering, you have data warehousing, you have real time analytics, you have uh, Power BI. OK, so now when you're working in data engineering, OK, data engineering is, let's say. Uh, basically Spark in Microsoft Fabric, OK? You're working with Spark in Microsoft Fabric. So on Spark, when you're working, so you want to work with, let's say, lake houses. You want to work with notebooks. You want to, similar to your data breaks, we had the concept of Spark job definition, right? Where we had to just write a script, a Python script. We had to just submit a Python script, and we could automatically execute the script once you create a cluster, a Spark cluster. Same thing if I want to do here. That entire experience is called as data engineering, but with what you are basically working in that data engineering experience is nothing but the items. You work with a data pipeline. You work with a data flow. Those are termed as items in Microsoft Fabric, and this is what you basically are working with. These are the capabilities that lie within a specific experience. 
you're working with data factory data factory has to so data factory is the experience but with what you're working inside the experience is nothing but the items that is your pipelines or the data flow okay so these are the terms that are there in your microsoft fabric portal okay you have the tenant which is nothing but determines that you can use microsoft fabric it's like a subscription okay capacity the compute okay workspace like if you recall i told you all that data factory data breaks all of them you need to configure separate workspaces here you don't have to do that you can just create one workspace and you will get the experience of all okay then experience okay and finally the item so these are the terms that you will that come frequently when you work with microsoft fabric now let's talk about the licenses that are there in microsoft fabric similar to your m365 you have the licenses okay you need to have one of the licenses okay which will determine the use of microsoft fabric either as the entire organization or according to the departments but you need to have a microsoft fabric license okay now the very first license is called as the pay as you go license similar to your microsoft i mean similar to your azure okay so you can go with a pay as you go license so this will have the full capability of microsoft fabric all the items all the experiences you will get when you use this particular license so this is the very first license that is there the second license is the reserved instance similar to your azure reserved instance where you can res uh, secure or reserve the um, instances or resources that you require for one year two year three years and you will get a discount right similar to that you have the reserved instance and this also has the full capabilities all the experiences of microsoft fabric now the next one is as your uh, is uh, power bi so what has microsoft done okay they have integrated the fabric portal into the earlier power bi service okay if you are familiar with it we had power bi had three softwares that is power bi desktop power bi mobile app power bi service right desktop is somewhere you create your okay desktop is where you create your reports and once you have create your, created your reports you publish those reports and you create dashboards out of it okay so what they have done they have integrated the fabric portal into this service itself okay into this service portal itself okay so you just have to switch between the two and you can experience the fabric portals i'll just show you all that as well but what happens to the power bi licenses so if you recall even power bi service requires a organizational id requires a license okay power bi service requires a license desktop doesn't require a license at all it is free you can install it on your windows operating system it is only available on the windows operating system okay so what happens to those licenses like i told you it has been integrated into the fabric i mean in, uh, fabric has been integrated into the service itself so what happens to the existing power bi licenses so in case you have one of the power bi licenses you can definitely use them okay so we all know the different licenses in power bi the one is a premium license okay so this will also have the full capacity or, or the full capabilities of or, or what do i mean by full capacities meaning all the capacities okay like i told you license determines the capacity in microsoft fabric okay so you can have a higher capacity depending on the license that you have so it will have the full uh, capabilities of microsoft fabric the next license is that you can create microsoft fabric also through the azure portal okay it is something called as the asqs that you will use 
okay what is this asq this is something that you can create based on your azure subscription you will be using the money from the azure uh, from your azure uh, subscription and you will create a asq and based on that you can use the microsoft fabric portal but this will have very few capacities within it okay um, you can use only f2 f4 which i will show you what i mean by this in the next slide itself so you can have very limited capacities not all capacities will be available to you if you create a ace queue and you use uh, microsoft fabric so at times your data like i said is when you're working at an enterprise uh, the data is huge in size so this is not an ideal license to purchase so with the ace queue the next license that you can have is the Power BI free, or now it is called as Microsoft Fabric free. It is no longer called as Power BI free. This is nothing but the earlier Power BI free license where you would get a trial period of 60 days. Okay. The same license you can use, but this has a limit. Okay. It has a validity of only 60 days two months. So after that, you need to purchase one of the higher licenses that are there. Then you can definitely use the Power BI Pro license. OK, this will give you only one capacity, but uh, I mean one of the capacity SKUs that is there. Um, so you can have the Pro license as well, the Power BI Pro, or you could even go with the PPU. OK, PPU also, but this will have partial capabilities of Microsoft Fabric. OK, these will not have full capabilities. OK, whereas these will have this is this will have partial capabilities or partial uh, or not all the capacities will be available to you. OK, uh, when you are talking about the license. OK, so these are the licenses that you can have or you can purchase. These are the equivalent SKUs. OK. Or, or capacities that are associated with your license. So if you go with premium capacities or pay as you go or the um, reserved instance, you will get uh, capacities from these uh, from these SKUs. These are the SKUs that will be available and you can see the capacity units that you will get. OK, so this is the equivalent Power BI SKU. So like I told you, Power BI, they have integrated the same SKUs of Power BI into the Fabric portal. So it's not different. It is the same. OK, but if you go with a pro license, this is the only SKU that you will get. OK, uh, if you use a pro license or you can get even smaller ones. OK, and these are pertaining to the pro Power BI pro license uh, and free license. Also, you will get a trial capacity. OK, that is of F60. No, it is. It will have some other um capacity which i don't remember but yeah it will be a trial period of 60 days then if you go with the asq these are the SKUs that will be available to you not more than that okay if you want to work with um you you want to process more data okay it is recommended that uh you at least have a pro license or you go with sorry one of the premium licenses okay so let's just see how to use the fabric portal so that's just this is the cost equivalent cost in dollars okay but this is something that you have already paid okay once you purchase the license and based on that this is how it will deduct the money okay and you will come to know that your license is coming to an end okay so this is what it will be this is the costing basically that is there but this will be taken care by your admin. OK, like I said, similar to your M365 that is there. OK, it will all be taken care by your organization admin. OK. So let's just see how to you. Let's just uh, look at the Azure. I mean, sorry, the Microsoft Fabric portal, how to sign in. What is the URL? OK, if you want to you go and log into the Fabric portal. So if you want to work with Microsoft Fabric, the URL is called as app. 
www.fabric.microsoft.com. Okay, so this is the URL. Okay, if you see, this has been uh, integrated into the Power BI service itself. Okay, so here, like I said, you need an organizational ID. Okay, uh, apart from that, if you don't have one, you can definitely create one. Okay, so this is how your Microsoft Fabric portal will look. So you can see it has been divided into different experiences, and these are the experiences. So when we talk about DP600, only DP600, you will see you will, the experiences that you will get is the data factory, data engineering, and the data warehouse. These are the three uh, main experiences that we will be using. Now, let's say I want to navigate to one of these experiences. So either you navigate from here or you can come on the left hand side. If you see, we have this Microsoft Fabric icon. If you click on this, OK, you can see all the experiences. And now you can see some Synapse uh, related experiences. So that is why they have been segregated in this way. So let's navigate to the data engineering experience. Now, within the data engineering experience, you can see lake house, notebook, spark job definition, data pipeline, and et cetera. What are these? These are nothing but the items within your experience. So you want to work with data engineering, you will get these items within it. Okay. And we are going to see the lake house. Okay. I'll show you how to create a lake house. OK, we'll see what it is and how to work with it. Uh, and then I'll just give you all a walkthrough on the other uh, experiences that are there. Now, let's say you want to create. So this, if you see, is a default workspace. OK, now let's say you want to create a shared workspace. So you just have to come to this workspaces icon. OK, and you can create a new workspace over here. So I'll just go ahead and create one. I'll just call this uh, this thing. And now to this workspace, you can allocate a capacity. So if you click on this, you will see you will get the option. So currently I'm going with the trial one. OK, uh, the trial one will have all the fabric capacity. OK, that is there. And I'll just say apply. And this is how a workspace will be created. Now to the workspace name next to it, if you see, there is a diamond symbol. Okay, there is a diamond symbol. So, what does this diamond symbol indicate? That this workspace, okay, has fabric capabilities. Okay, you can add fabric specific capabilities. You can work with notebooks, that is, data breaks. You can work with data pipelines. You can work with data flows. You can create reports. You can create dashboards. You can work with real time analytics. Okay. So this diamond indicates that this workspace has the fabric capabilities. Earlier, when you used to work with Power BI, that didn't have, if you go to a Power BI workspace, so if I go to Power BI and I try to create, so this is a workspace that I have. If you see here, there is no diamond symbol. Okay, so the Power BI workspace does not indicate that this is a Yes, it also has the leverage of Copilot. Okay, but Copilot needs to be enabled for specific tenants, and that can only be done by your admin. But definitely, you can have Copilot over here. So I will show you. But uh, it needs to be enabled. Like as your Open AI, also you have over here. All those features need to be enabled for you, and that is done by the uh, license administrator. That is. There. So I am not the administrator. If you have to find out whether you are the administrator or not. OK, you have this option over here that is the admin portal. Sorry, in settings. You have this option of admin portal. If you click on this, you will come to know who is the admin. 
sadly i'm not the admin okay so if you come here if you see i'm not the admin i'm just work I'm, i am a tenant of that of this subscription so we have gone with the uh, we have taken the approach a architect a okay yeah so like i told you you need an organizational id you need a you need to be a part of a enterprise if you are not a part of the enterprise you will not be able to use microsoft fabric okay so this is your uh, fabric portal okay this is how you can use it now let's do one thing um let's take a break before we move ahead with the concepts move ahead with further concepts so let's take a 20 it's almost 2 11 25 so let's take a 20 minute break and then we'll resume with the topic so i'll just start the clock no there is no other way i told you about the e5 developer program So you will have to create a 90 day trial. Okay, it's a developer program where you get 90 day trial. And using that, you can work with Microsoft Fabric that is there. Okay, so let's take a 20 minute break. I'll just start the clock.
Hello everyone, I hope you all are back. Please put a yes if you all are back. Okay, so let's move ahead with the next topic. So another challenge uh, that Microsoft saw, okay, is related to the data, okay? They saw that uh, there are multiple departments within our enterprises, right? We have multiple departments, whether it's the sales department or let's say we are a retail company. Okay, and in a retail company, we all know there are different departments. That is the sales department, you have the marketing department, let's say you have the inventory department. Okay, we have multiple departments within it. So within that departments that are there, let's say I want to share my data or I am storing my data and data is being stored, let's say, in multiple data lakes. Do you all know what is a data lake? Can you all quickly put it in the chat box? What is a data lake? Yes, guys, what is your understanding of a data lake? Let me know in the chat. Okay, what else? What is a data lake? Okay, I wouldn't call it multi-structure. I would call it uh, all types of data. We don't call it multi-structure actually, but we can call it like all types of data. Yeah, so guys, you are absolutely right. Data lake is nothing but like a dump yard. Okay, it's like a lake that gets created where you can store any type of data. We know there are three types of data, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured or structured data. Correct? We can store any kind or type of data that is there. And that kind of data that gets stored, the general format of the data is what? It is a file format. Okay, it is a file format. So we all know that people are not some people are not well versed with databases they are not familiar with the tables that are there correct so what do they do they go with their traditional file format right it is something that is simpler to work with people who are from non tech background they can work with the file format use the text file use the uh, excel file or what any kind of file so structured data which that is nothing but your csv data your semi structured data that is nothing but your uh, JSON data or XML data, or you can have unstructured data, which is your blobs, which is your images, videos, audios, etc. So any type of data that you have, you can just dump it into uh, a place, a single location in the form of a file, and that is called as a data lake. So data lake is something that we let most of the organizations use, and the other alternative to it is a data warehouse because our volume of data is large okay the the data that we need to manage is huge in size so generally the data lake fails at times so it is better that you use the data warehouse so these are the two ways in which generally data is stored in an organization now this is what also microsoft saw okay that different departments within the same organization 
okay they have a tendency to store data related i mean they will store data in their own data data lake or data warehouse sales will store in their own data lake or warehouse marketing the same customer service the same so what happens generally is that these data lakes that are there that are formed they will function independently correct because they are being created and managed by different departments sales department marketing department or hr department they are all individually handling it and they are separate departments so what happens generally is that it leads to something called as data silos Now, what are these data silos? Like I told you, let's say we are we are a part of a retail company, okay? And in that retail company, I told you we have different departments: sales, marketing, customer service, HR, etc. So now, let's say I want to share, or I want the marketing team, or I, let's say I want the sales team to access the marketing data. Okay, generally it is not as easy as you know to share the data. correct it is very difficult to share data across now let's say sales department is storing data in the form of a uh, data lake and the format of the data is what it is a file format right let's say marketing department stores data in the form of a data warehouse in the form of relational tables so what is happening the format is changing so what we generally do we convert the file format into a relational table that means you first of all need to share a copy of your data with the marketing department okay they will convert it into a sales department i means a converted into a table sorry my god okay and because of that okay what will happen additional copy of your data gets created okay additional copy of your data gets created and at times you at times the marketing like whatever your data you are sharing across you need to apply different access different security again the same thing that you would do on top of the uh, data uh, services the same thing okay depending on the department let's say i don't want to give full access to the sales department i don't want to give access entirely or, or i want only certain data to be visible okay only critical data to be visible okay or let's say do no, i don't want sensitive data to be visible so we apply sensitivity labels on top of that we need to give different people access to it so we don't want that to we don't want that to you know do we don't want to do it and because of that what happens you generally lay or you create a separate copy and on top of that copy you do all these operations we don't want to do that let's say we want to keep it as simple as possible so what happens generally in that is that it leads to these data silos then it leads to multiple copies being created okay now i told you one let's say sales department is storing data in the form of data lakes so data lakes which is generally the file format the um the engine that requires you you to analyze files work with files is called as spark okay generally people use the spark engine okay in order to analyze the data that is there in spark okay and i told you that marketing department stores the data in the form of a table in form of in a data warehouse which is nothing but a relational table only okay they store data in that format itself so for that you require uh, or let's say i want to process that data so for that you would require a sql engine or let's say you're working with a power bi domain you're working with a power bi experience okay so then what happens is that you require two different engines to work with the same data you're creating a relational copy you're converting that data into a file to a table and plus you need two different computes because the workload is different one is a file format the other is a table 
so that's where microsoft thought we have to even overcome these problem we don't want people to do resource sharing okay we want people to smoothly collaborate okay we don't want sorry resource overhead meaning they don't want the copy of the data redundant data to be created you know data to be replicated we call it as redundancy right we don't want that to happen okay so microsoft said let's break that also let's break down these silos and create something called as a one lake create something called as a one lake so now what is this one lake this one lake is something that is similar to your one drive we have all used one drive in one drive we can upload any type of data right any type whether it's a word file it's a powerpoint presentation let's say it's a excel file it's a video audio etc whatever it is we can upload one drive okay no matter what the format is it's the same thing for your data no matter what the format is let it be a data lake let it be a data warehouse let it be any engine whether spark or sql doesn't matter let's just bring it or that also on one platform and that one platform is called as a one lake so one lake is where is actually similar to your data services that for that you have microsoft fabric as a portal and now on the data services you need the most important thing that is data needs to be stored we all know that needs to be stored whether it's a data lake it's a blob storage it's a data warehouse any format of storage or any form of storage that is there you need to store the data and you need to extract the data from somewhere and that storage of microsoft fabric is your one lake so one lake is where you can use you can upload any format of the data you want it in the form of tables you want it in the form of files okay you want it to work in the form of a data lake and use the spark engine and along with that use the relational tables and the sql engine you can do that on one platform and that is your one lake okay so one lake is basically the heart of microsoft fabric it is a lake centric architecture so the base architecture of one lake is your data lake itself okay it uses the concept of data lake itself okay but there is a twist to this okay there is a twist to this okay the base format is the data lake so what does it say how does it benefit you it says okay you create only one data store the data in one workspace okay upload the data at one location and then you can use the data in any format that you want in on any engine that you want okay so that is why one only one copy gets uploaded so let's say you upload or you store the data in the form of a text file or a csv file or an image you can definitely convert that into a table and start using it at one location itself without creating a copy of that data okay and using another engine to process it you can process the data at one single location and that is what is one lake then if you have a single storage similar to your single services data services what are the advantages the same thing security data governance um accessibility etc okay multiple copy silos don't get created okay you have only one single copy of that data and that is called as your well one lake so one lake is the hub of your data okay now why use one lake i have already talked about it okay it is something that is a you know a unified single platform for any one within the organization to upload the data okay in no matter what the format is you can just upload it and you can easily manage you can easily collaborate you don't have to create a copy of that data okay only single copy is there and you can use that then the other advantage like why you should use one lake is if you remember we talked about the tenant and tenants can be allocated only if by the admin by the microsoft admin how we have an admin for our m365 license 
exactly the same way there, here also there is only one admin the admin has the maximum uh, ownership okay so he decides or she decides who to give what access till what access like our back also you can apply role based access control also you can apply okay that person will determine the boundaries okay of the data who gets what data who doesn't get what data apply sensitivity labels okay prevent it being shared to other organizations okay uh, that are a part <laughs> sorry that are a part of the data i mean part of your one lay so it is in the hands of the administrator the other advantage is that it is open at every level now what do i mean by this is that you can use so one lake like i told you is a lake centric approach it is built on the azure data lake storage gen 2 okay it supports any type of file it supports data warehousing as well okay so you can see it can automatically switch engine so you can even it is also compatible with applications like the data breaks as your data breaks as your hd insights so if you have other external uh, applications but exists that something that can connect to the data lake as your data lake gen 2 okay you can definitely use those you need separate apis okay to uh, work with them so you need to have the knowledge of the apis and that is not a part of this course at all okay you need to study i think it's not a part of any course you need to separately uh, study that then you can also have a one lake explorer similar to your storage explorer that is there okay uh, where you can upload let's say you just have to install this application onto your windows okay one lake file explorer and you can easily upload data okay let's say there are non technical people who don't understand the concept of workspaces giving access and to the workspace and uploading the data how to upload the data etc they can just come to this one uh, lake file explorer and they can easily upload it so you, this is also the benefit of using uh, one lake the other benefit like i told you one copy okay of data okay whether it whether, even if you upload the data in the form of file you can convert that data into a table and you can do write sql queries uh, uh, do all kinds of sql operations on top of it okay another important feature of one lake is called as the shortcut okay so what is this shortcut i will just explain that you don't need to see this yeah so this is a very important uh feature of one lake okay what is a shortcut now let's say we have data we are uploading data from various external sources okay it can be a block storage or your laptops or it could be coming from a database it could be coming from sharepoint or it could be coming from any number of sources okay or let's say um data is coming from let's say uh, amazon s3 we have amazon s3 we have google cloud platform storage correct those are third party i mean apart from azure we have multiple other uh, external sources let's say you don't want to get or upload the data into one lake okay you don't want that feature to come in you don't want the data to come in to the one lake so what you can do is instead of uploading a data into the one lake you can just create a link like how in data factory we create a a, a connection string we have like a symbolic link that gets created where the data is not into the data factory but it's still present at the source it's just that you are creating a you're linking the two okay it's just like you're linking the two the same thing you can do even in your uh, fabric okay by not getting the data into one lake okay keeping it at the data source itself and that is called as a shortcut feature so you need to create a shortcut a shortcut is like a symbolic link that you create okay which links your data source external data sources currently there are only 
three external data sources that is Amazon S3. You have Google, sorry, four. You have Dataverse also if you are from the Power Platform background. So you have the Dataverse. It's like a database only. I, I am not well, I have not much knowledge about it, but yeah, so it you can use Dataverse. And apart from that, you can even link to the Azure Data Lake Gen 2 account if you have without actually getting the data into the Power BI, uh, sorry, into the one link. The other thing, other shortcut is that you can have from the internal sources. Let's say you have multiple workspaces across your uh, fabric. OK, multiple workspaces, let's say divided in teams. OK, you have an entire organizational tenant and you have multiple workspaces created according to the according to the uh, teams or departments that you have. And let's say you want to get data from the workspaces that are there, but they are a part of the same organizational tenant. OK, you can definitely do that by using the shortcut feature. So it's not like you're creating or you're uploading the data into the one link. OK, you can get data from other workspaces also, but those will be internal shortcuts, meaning you can get data from lake houses, from data warehouses and something called as KQL databases, which you don't need to know, but it's just giving you as an information. So those are the types of shortcuts. So this is the definition of a shortcut. Again, the same thing. It's just a link, a symbolic link that you create, okay, like a connection string, okay, that links your one link to the data source, similar to your link service in the data factory. So these are the types of shortcuts I told, talked about internal shortcuts. Let's say you want to get data from multiple internal storage um, of my of one lake. Okay, that is your lake houses, your KQL database, and warehouses. So lake house is what we are going to see now. Okay, in some time I will be explaining what it is. So these are the shortcuts that you can create, and it, not just from your workout, oh, sorry, workspace, you can get from other workspaces also. You can get the data, I mean, link the data without actually getting it into your one link. Okay, so across different workspaces, you can get the data. Then you have the external shortcuts, that is the ADLS shortcut, which is for the data lake Gen 2 account. And then even with Amazon S3, OK, you can do the same thing. So this is how it is now. Currently, uh, they have also introduced, I told you all, GCP and uh, Dataverse also shortcuts for external features. I'll show you that as well once we move to once I complete one concept and then I'll show you the demo of it. Some more information on where can I create? I'll show you. I'll be showing this. I will not be actually implementing it, but I'll show you from where you can do it. OK. There's some APIs through which you can access the shortcut feature. Now, your um, I'll just share another presentation. So this was one module. OK, uh, not one module, half the module. OK, uh, we'll now look at another concept of Microsoft Fabric. Just one minute, let me just check the presentation. So one link is basically like I told you the storage. OK, but where you are actually uploading the data, OK, where you are actually uploading the data in uh, Microsoft Fabric is the lake house. Now, what is a lake house? So a lake house term that you see, OK, this term that you see has been derived from is nothing but basically
data lake plus so this term is basically taken from the lake okay that is coming from the data lake and the other term that is coming that is the house is coming from the data warehouse now what does this mean this means that uh, when you upload the data okay you talk about one lake one lake is like the storage but where you are actually uploading the data is the lake house this is the place where you are actually uploading your data okay it is a combination of your data lake and a data warehouse so if you recall i talked about like the format of the data where you can upload the data in any format correct in one lake only one copy gets created the silos break down etc etc this is the place where you are actually uploading the data one lake is having all the other features as well it's basically the monitoring that it's basically like a monitoring service responsible behind your Then comes this. Okay, it's just a name being given. Okay, for the storage, but the actual place where you will be uploading the data is your lake house. The lake house has the capability of two. That is the lake and the data warehouse. Okay, it is built on top of your one lake. So one lake basically deals with scalability and everything with the engine. Okay, but where you have to upload the data is your lake house so you can upload the data in the form of a data lake okay meaning files correct data lake we all know is the base format is nothing but files it's like a file storage whereas a data warehouse is nothing but a table when you are actually uploading a table correct so this is a combination of the two and this is where you can actually switch between the two you want to do uh, you want to do an analysis of the data okay using the files so you can go with the data lake and the engine responsible be that the engine that is used is the spark engine itself but when you are working with the data warehouse where tables relational tables etc all of that comes into picture the engine responsible is the sql engine okay. is this clear so this is what basically lake house is it is nothing but a unified platform that combines and provides two things that is flexible and scalable storage of a data lake and the querying and analysis or uh, and sql operations you can perform like a data warehouse okay so on top of it you can do analysis you can create reports you can uh, and analyze data using the notebook feature the data brick that we talk about it's nothing but this right exactly the same thing so that's what we are doing over here okay exact same thing so when you create a lake house okay in microsoft fabric there are three things that get created by default okay it is something that by default gets created and if you have to experience the data you have to experience the fabric uh, so you have to experience the lake house it is present in the data engineering experience of microsoft fabric sql operations uh, if you recall there is a concept of data delta lake something called as delta lake which comes with asset properties where you create a delta table okay so if you if you know how to create a delta table then you can definitely do sql operations on a data lake in a lake house all you need to know i will be showing you all that as well so delta table how you can create so the concept of delta table uh, if you know so i will talk about it i will definitely show you all also one demo i'm a basic demo i will show you all about it okay so when we say or when you are creating a lake house or we have created a lake house there are three things that get created by default one is your lake house itself where you can work with files and delta tables so what is basically going in the background okay 
in a lake house like i told you you can work with data lake you can work with delta table okay so you can upload data you are basically uploading data in the file format okay in the file format and when you upload data in the file format okay the i told you that no matter what kind of data you upload semi structured structured unstructured data okay microsoft fabric has decided that we will keep one uh, format of the file also okay we will keep one format of the file also and for files they have decided that with no matter what kind of file you upload for one lake and for the lake house the format is going to be a pair quet format okay it is going to be the base format is going to be a pair quet format okay and when you are working with table so the table like i told you it is going to be so when you say table so at times you want you know on your file you want the acid properties you want to apply acid properties perform acid properties should have the oltp uh, it should be like an oltp workload right so if you want to do that on top of a file so what you do you create a table and that table okay is called as a delta table okay so on top of a lake house when you want to work with a file so that is nothing but your data lake okay and you want to apply sql commands you want to perform acid properties on top of it okay that is called the table format that by default one lake uses or microsoft fabric uses is the delta table okay it is the delta table so the combination of these two in microsoft fabric so one lake has a base format okay if you are loading data in the form of file uploading data in the form of file no matter csv text image whatever you want to upload you upload the format that the one lake storage or the lake house will understand or will make it okay for its understanding is going to be the paraquet format and if you want to apply acid properties on those data lake that you upload the table that it will create is going to be a delta table okay this is what basically lake house does and along with lake house once you create a lake house okay there are three things that get created one is the lake house itself which is like the data lake okay simple data lake okay on top of that there is something called as a sem uh, semantic model that gets created so let's say you want to do reporting you want to create dashboards okay you can use the semantic model which is the earlier term for data set in power bi now it has been renamed to or then there's a new nomenclature to it that is called as a semantic model so let's say you want to do modeling you want to do you not modeling actually but you want to do uh, create reports you want to create dashboards okay this is the place this is the data set that you use so by default it gets created so let's say you have uploaded a file and using that file you want to create reports or dashboards so for that microsoft has kept that in mind and it has you know created a semantic default model a semantic model that gets created and the third thing that gets created is a sql analytical endpoint now what is this sql analytical endpoint let's say you want to write you want to uh, do sql queries okay you want to write sql queries on the files not not the delta table okay these two things are different keep in mind this is like a normal table whereas when you uh, when you are working in a lake house you can also get a table but that table is going to be a delta table keep that in mind now let's say i want to write simple select queries which you can do on top of a delta table as well okay that's not a problem but let's say you are more comfortable with a table normal table a relational table you can do that on the same file for that you have a analytical 
SQL analytical endpoint created. Okay, so for that, you can use this. So these are the three things that get created by default. Okay, in a, whenever you create a lakehouse in Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so these are the things that you can do in a lakehouse. You can work with Spark. Okay. You can work with a SQL analytical endpoint. You can work with data flows. You can work with data pipelines. Okay, so these are the things. Okay, you can even visualize the data that you have loaded into the lakehouse using the Power BI feature that is there. So let's see a quick demo. Just before that, let me. I'll just come back in two minutes. Just give me two minutes. Yeah, sorry. So now let's look at a quick demo on this, how to create a lakehouse. I'll be sharing my screen. Okay. So we had, just before we took the break, we had seen how to create a workspace. So I'll be using the same workspace for the demos that I'm going to show you all today. Now, if you see here, you have this option of new. So any new item you want to create. Okay, I'm in Power BI. Okay, so any new item that you want to create, first of all, you, you know, when we are talking about the lake house item, okay, like I told you all, it is in the data engineering experience. So make sure you navigate to it. Okay, once you navigate, you can see the experiences in that. And if you see here, you have the lake house, this thing. So now if you have to create a lake house, okay, just go ahead and create one. Just click on this and I'll say webinar lake house and I'll just say create. So now if you see here, there are two things that get created. One is the tables, the other is files. So that's what I told you. It is basically nothing but these two and the uh, 
uh, portal that you are seeing, it is termed as a lake house portal. I mean, it is termed as a lake house explorer, not a this thing, but a lake house explorer. Okay, so that people can easily navigate between, uh, can understand, explore things in the lake house. Now, if you if you recall, I told you all that there are three things that get created in a lake house. One is the lake house itself. The other is a semantic model. So let's say you want to create reports, dashboards on, on whatever data you upload in the lake house. Okay, using that data itself, you can create a report or a dashboard. And the next thing that is there you can use is the SQL endpoint for a, for writing SQL queries. But this SQL endpoint, okay, keep in mind, is a read-only endpoint that gets created. Meaning you can't upload, or sorry, you can't update, you can't perform CRUD operations, okay? You can, out of the CRUD, only read operations you can do. Okay, that is write simple select queries on top of it. Okay, this is what you can do. You can't do anything beyond this in a SQL endpoint. Okay, you can't write uh, insert commands. You can't use the update command. You can't use the create table, etc. All of that. This is just a read only endpoint that gets created. So let's go ahead and upload data in a lake house. So whenever you're uploading data into a lake house, you can only upload the data, okay? You have to move only in the file format, okay? You can just do that. So you can get the data from your local system, from your laptop, okay? Either an entire folder or an entire file you can upload. So just go ahead and say upload. And if you see the interface is similar to the block storage and the data lake, so just click on browse. And to this, I'm going to upload the sales data that is there that is a sales.csv so i'll be sharing the lab links and everything with you all so that you all can practice it later okay and i'll just say upload and now you can see the data has been uploaded and now if i click on files you will see the data so now if you can see the preview of the data i just clicking on it so as of now, this is a CSV format, but for lake house, for the one lake that is there, it is a, it is understanding it or keeping it or storing the data, the format as a parquet file. Okay. Now let's say I want to convert this or I want to use this. Just before that, if you want to create a shortcut, okay, you can definitely do that in a lake house. Only in a lake house, you can do that. You have to come to these three dots. Can you see you have this option of new shortcut? So you can just click on it. And now you can see the various options that are there. So if you recall, I told you all about Amazon S3, Azure Data League, Gen 2, and you have Dataverse, if you know Power Platform. And also you have the Google Cloud Storage, which is currently in preview, but you can definitely connect to it. Okay, you can't get data into one lake, but you can definitely link to it. Then you have the internal sources. So if you click on this and whichever uh, lake houses or warehouses or KQL databases that are there, okay, within your organizational tenant, you will see that listed over here. So this wine storage or training that you see, all these are present in different workspaces, but still I can access them because I've been given the authority and I can just connect to that data without actually uploading the data into my lake house. So this is how you can use the shortcut feature. Okay. Now you can load this particular data into a table. Okay, you can load it into a delta table. I told you all when you want to work with tables in the lake house, similar to the delta lake that is there. Okay, you create a delta table. It is like a delta lake that gets created, which gets asset properties, correct? So this is what you can do by just coming onto your file and clicking on these three dots and saying load to tables. Normally, when you're working in data breaks or you're working in synapse, okay? in the notebook feature or something. Guys, please keep yourselves on mute. If you're not, not talking to me, just a humble request, please keep yourselves on mute.
okay so normally in data breaks or synapse we normally need to write commands right we need to know one of the programming languages either r python pyspark that means okay or scala okay and first of all when we are working in data breaks we need to mount the storage and all those things we need to do right write a, a path give a path to it mount it on the adfs okay that is the azure data factory uh, data breaks file system right mount on top of it and then you can like um uh, you can uh then you mount it and then out of that you create a table i mean first of all you need to create a data frame then on top of that you need to create a delta table etc here you don't have to do any such thing right here they have given you a feature okay just click on the click on these three dots say i want to load it to table and you just click on new table because there's no existing table we have just created a new lake house and that is once that is done you just have to say load and automatically you will get a delta table created without much i mean without any coding okay without any coding you will get a delta table created so let it just get created if you see that it has been created okay now if i come over here in tables can you see and if you see next to so it's a table icon but the symbol is a little different which is a table and there is a triangle so this kind of a table indicates that this is a delta table is this clear and this is how the table will look like similar to your file if you see it has just by clicking on a button it has converted that file to a delta table okay so on top of this you can do asset properties analyze the data using the notebook feature so if you see here you have this option of notebook feature okay you can definitely do that you can if you have an existing notebook you can open you can go ahead and open a new notebook okay on top of the table so you're on top of the lake house so let's say you want to do analysis of the data in the form of a file or a table you can do that okay using this feature so this is nothing but the data bricks feature that is there okay so if you just click on new notebook i'll just show you all one simple example okay we don't have time to do all the demos there there is lots to uh, see in this okay now i told you that you have to load the data into a data frame that is also become very easy in microsoft fabric so i'll just say code and if you come to your lake houses and you click on files now if you click on these three dots can you see you have an option of load data and we know when we load data there are two ways in which uh, in spark we can load the data one is the rdd that is resilient data sorry resilient distributed data set and the other is a data frame so rdds have become obsolete they have become old school nobody uses that okay nowadays the format in which you load the data is a data frame and there are two types of data frames one is the spark data frame okay for big data analysis which uses the spark compute and the other is pandas data frame so if you just click on these you will see automatically similar to the mounting that you do in a data bricks notebook or a synapse notebook it has happened automatically over here i am not doing anything i have just written but here the base language is pyspark you can definitely change the language in whatever language you are comfortable you can definitely change that okay so here if you see it has automatically loaded the data it is reading the data you can, you just have to execute it okay so initially it will take some time because it has to start the spark cluster okay it is initializing the spark cluster if you see here so this is how you can do the analysis okay of your data on the files by loading it to a data frame and this is how we generally do right so you can see that it has been done over here exact same thing you can even do it on top of a table okay let's say you have uh, a table you can also load data here but unfortunately here when you are loading only a spark data frame will get loaded because it's a delta table 
Okay, only Spark data you can Spark data frame you will get. You will not get the pandas data frame. So that is there. Okay, so this is how it will look. You can do any if you know Pi Spark, you know R. You can do that. So something some operations like these. Okay, it's not recognized. I have to. So you can just print the schema of the data frame and you will see. Okay, this is how it will work. You can even do something like df dot count, which will count the total records in your data frame. Okay, so these are the number of records that you have. So this is how you can work with your data. Okay, in Spark. So this is how you can analyze a data frame. Very easy, right? Just upload. I didn't have to configure the compute. All I need to create was a workspace. I could easily create. I mean, the compute was taken care by Microsoft Fabric. Okay. So if you're working with notebooks, you're working with lake houses, the compute behind it is going to be Spark. But when you work with warehouses, the compute is going to be a SQL engine. And we will see the data warehousing concepts in the second half once we take our lunch break. Okay, so this is very easy. Then in a delta table, you have two types of table. One is a managed table and the other is a external table. So all that also you can create over here. Okay, you can easily do that if you have knowledge about it. Sadly, we don't have time to look into it, but you can definitely uh, do that. Okay, in a lake house. The other amazing thing of a lake house, I'll go back to the lake house. I've come back here. Now, all I have to do is, like I told you, we have a SQL endpoint where we can write read only select queries. So, if I can just navigate to this, so if you see here, just switch, okay, and you will get a SQL server kind of an environment. If you see here, if you see now, if you see the format of the table. It is different. The schema that it is using is a DBO schema and not a delta schema. Okay, it's not a delta table. Mind you, those are different things, right? So if you see here, you get a relational table kind of a thing. How you load data in a SQL server or in an Oracle database, the tables that you get exactly that particular format you're getting here. Now you can even write a SQL query. So if you you can just say new SQL query. And you can write a SQL query. So if I just say select, but this keep in mind is a read only select query. Okay. Start from sorry, select, not start. Let's say item uh, comma. Sum. So I'm doing a group by operation. Okay. Sum quantity multiplied by unit price. And I'm giving this an alias of revenue. Okay. Comma. Sorry. From sales, which is the table name. And like I said, I'm doing a group by operation. Group by item. And order by again. Uh, revenue. Okay, so whatever revenue you get, so revenue, but in a descending manner. Okay, and now I can just put this query to run similar to your SQL query SSMS, right? SQL Server Management Studio, exactly the same way. You can see that I can run a query. Okay, so this is how it will look like. Let's say people don't know how to write SQL queries. Okay, they don't know what does a select command do, what does this do. They understand things when they are visualized. Okay, when the thing is visualized. So, no worries, you can even write a visual query. So, if you click on this tab and if you drag the table onto the canvas, okay, you will get a visual query, okay, that is being created over here. So, if you have worked with Power Query Editor, Okay, the same exact in interface is there, but it's just not in that format. It's just you have it's in the form of visuals. What kind of transformations, what kind of cleaning operations, what kind of queries you're writing, you get you kind of visualize those queries. So now let's say I want to remove or select 
specific columns. Okay, I can just click on the button over here and I'll just say choose columns. Okay, and let's say I just want to keep two columns that is sales order number and sales order line number. And I just say okay. So what will happen out of all those so many columns that were there, you got only two columns. Then on top of this, you can do a group by operation. So if you see here, you have a group by operation, just come here. Okay. And let's say I don't want on this, but I want on the order number. Okay. And I want to give it a name as line items. And just say I want to do a count distinct values. And I want to do it on the sales order line number. And I say OK. And if you see here, you can you will get a group operation based on the order number. OK. And then, of course, on top of this, you can create a report. OK. If you switch to the model tab, you can do data modeling. OK. If you have multiple tables and you have to establish relationships. OK, all of that you can do. Just you have to switch to the model tab. OK, and you can do that. So power pivoting that we used to call pivoting models, creating star schema, subject schema, etc. All of that uh, writing measures, that's expressions. If you see currently this has been disabled because this is a SQL endpoint. It is that feature will only be enabled where you can apply CRUD operations, which is nothing but your data warehouse. So this feature will be enabled over there. OK, now let's say I want to create a report. You can do that. You just have to click on new report and you will get the ex So it is saying I'm using the default. So if you recall, there was a default semantic model Power BI uh, data set that gets created. So it is just using that exact same data and it will let you create a report. So if you click on continue, you will see the exact same interface as your Power BI desktop. So it will take some time. So if you see here, you have the exact same interface as your Power BI desktop. OK, so here you can now create a report based on the data that is there. So I'll take a simple table. Just expand this and to the table, I will add, let's say item. And let's say I go with the unit price. So I get something like this. OK. So you need to know the visualizations of Power BI. That's what I said, prerequisite. OK, I can go with a clustered bar chart. So just place that over here. And to this, let's say I add item again on the Y axis and I'll add the quantity on the X axis. So this is how you can get. OK, you can create multiple pages. Your report can have multiple pages. right? And once this is done, all you have to do is save the report. You say save. Just click on save and give it a name. Say sales. Sorry, item. Sales report. OK, all of those things you can do on the report. OK, uh, formatting the visuals and etc. All of that, please explore that more. Once this is done, you can see that your report has been saved. OK, exactly the same way how you used to publish your report from the desktop application. Correct. Here you can automatically do it online. You don't need the desktop application. OK, you can directly create reports. Sharing of the data has become easy. Loading of the data has become easy. OK, and once this is done, now if you go to your workspace, you will see these many items. So this is basically module one where you are working with lake houses. OK, with within lake houses. OK, let's just quickly walk. I'll walk you through the presentation so you will understand what is there in the particular module. I'm not going to explain things because um, uh, it, 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 it is, you know, individual days that you require to explain more than that. 
OK, so. So this is what we had seen. Here can go ahead and quickly. Uh, put in the answers in the chat box. You can just give it a try. It's not hard and fast rule. OK, I can just give it a try. So just put in your answers in the chat box. Yes, absolutely right. One C. Yes, absolutely right. One C, two B, which is shortcut, and three A. Absolutely right. So this is what is the lake house, and then using the lake house. You can work with the notebooks. You can work with Apache Spark through the notebook feature. OK, we all know what is Spark. It is a big data engine for this where you want to do distributed data analysis. So we all know when the data or a particular work is distributed among team, OK, between different people. OK, that particular project gets executed much faster because you have divided the work. OK, and you are able to uh, achieve or you are able to complete the project. OK, the same thing is done when you analyze your data. Data is distributed, divided across the computers or across the cluster, across the compute nodes that you have across worker nodes in terms of Spark. OK, it is uploaded. I mean, it is distributed and some small work, I mean, some data will be allocated to one computer, some other data will be allocated to another computer, and they will process the data, analyze the data, and you can then it will be much faster because big data we all know has is huge in size, is huge in volume. I mean, the uh, yeah, huge in volume. The speed is fast. Okay, the type of the data, variety of the data is different. Okay, because we are working with a uh, data lake. Correct. Data lake we all know has different uh, types of data being loaded. Okay, so it has to be processed faster. So that is why you can also work with Spark. Okay, then you have the notebook feature. So what can you do with notebook? Okay, you can you can do aggregation, filtering, etc. All of that. Okay, load the data into a data frame. This is what we have seen. You can specify schema. You can do group operations, transform the data frame, OK, and store that transformed data frame, OK, and visualize data as well. All of that you can do, OK? You can do partitioning of the data. Then you can even work with SQL, OK? You have the SQL library present in Spark, OK? You can even do machine learning and stuff on a Spark data frame, OK? So you can work with SQL. There is a SQL API also that is something like this. And other way of working with SQL is through the magic method. So what is the magic method? It's just you have to specify in the cell percentage percentage SQL. OK, and you can then start work or writing SQL queries on top of your data frames. OK, so this is what you can do in your Spark or within the notebooks. OK, you can even visualize data. So there is a chart option next to your tables. OK, I'll just show that to you. So if you come to the notebook feature. And if you see here, you have this chart option. OK, so you want to visualize your data frame or any transformations or anything that you have done. OK, you can just click on this chart and you can visualize. You can even customize the chart, OK, according to whatever chart you require. But this is a very static way. 
okay you don't have much customization options okay so what you can do is you can convert this data frame into a pandas data frame and once you have converted the data frame into a pandas data frame okay so either you convert it so you can use the chart feature or you can convert the data frame into a pandas data frame and use the matplotlib or seaborn library on top of that but keep in mind those two libraries do not work on a spark data frame they only work on top of a pandas data frame okay so this is what is basically there in the first module okay for oh, this you don't need to do we will skip this then you can work with delta tables okay uh, you need to know what is a delta table and etc okay then how can you create a delta table is basically this so this is like i told you there are two types of delta table that is a managed table and the other is an external table so this is how you can create managed tables this is how you can so this is a simple way of creating so whenever you create a table the table that gets created is nothing but a managed table okay but if you have to create an external table this is what it is now what is the difference between the two i will just explain in short a managed table so when you uh, so when you are working with delta tables or lake house i told you the compute behind it is the spark cluster so in a spark cluster okay when you are working with tables it has a meta store okay where your meta data of that data that you have uploaded in the files okay the file feature that you saw in lake house okay the file that you have uploaded the meta data gets uploaded in that meta store okay but now let's say you have created a delta table out of that data okay so when you say you create a managed table okay by default the table i mean the meta data and the data from where you have created the table both get stored in the meta store okay both of them get stored in the meta store which is lying inside the spark cluster and then you are doing the processing and etc on top of that okay so that is called as a managed table when you have your data okay or which is in the files and the meta data of that files being stored in the meta store so on top of that if you create a table that is called as a managed table but now let's say you store the data okay that is there in the file system and not in the meta store okay the meta store will only have the meta data about the data that is stored in the files okay and uh, on based on that meta data if you create a table by giving it an external path where your file is present or where your data is actually present that table is called as a external table so it lies outside the data lies outside the meta store now what is the advantage okay what is the differentiating factor here is that when you drop a managed table okay there is no way of retrieving the files okay let's say you have accidentally deleted the files dropped the files etc okay there is no way you can recover them because your data and your meta data both are stored in the meta store of spark so and on top of that you have created a table so if you drop the table no way of retrieving it but that is not the case with the external table since your data is outside the meta store the meta store has what it has only the meta data of your data right meta data is what data about data so it is just the meta data that is present in the meta store so in case you drop the table or delete the table okay you can still recover the recover or create a new table because your data is lying outside the meta store okay so this is what is the difference between the external table and a managed table and you can create both in the 
spark cluster i mean in your this thing so you can work with delta tables there are ways in which you can work with delta tables one is you use the sql library of spark okay the other way is you use the percentage percentage sql because delta tables are nothing but asset tab i mean tables which have asset properties which have which are like oltp workloads correct so you can definitely do that okay you can work with write select queries write update queries do create etc all of that crud operations whatever you want you can do that on top of the delta table okay you can write queries for that and the other third way is the delta api that you can use it is a little different from the uh, from these two so if you see the syntax is a little different okay so it's using another you need to import another library that is called as delta dot tables and then you can start working with it so you can use the delta table api then along with that you have data versioning and time travel so whenever you create a delta table there is a file that is called as underscore delta underscore log that gets created okay by default okay it gets created and what is this file basically it is something that consists of the transaction history okay basically logs of the table that you have transactions that you have performed okay on top of the table at what time did you create the table at what time did you update the table okay and it gives it versions okay like version 1 version 2 version 0 okay it will allocate to that and along with that there will be a time stamp at what time did you update it what time did you create it all that information will be given so that information where it is stored it is stored in the uh, in that particular folder okay so this is the advantage of using the delta table okay you get time travel okay you can go back and view any modifications transformation look at the logs okay what time did you make that change what kind of change did you make whether it was a create table or did you update the table or did you drop the table okay so you can retrieve older versions of your data okay so this is what is basically data versioning and time travel which you can do on a delta table then you can even perform streaming okay let's say you have data coming from iot devices or or from real i mean real time analytics if you want to do okay the data is in the form of a streaming this thing so you can definitely do that okay because spark has a streaming library so you can definitely use that so you have a source stream and then you can definitely sync it into a delta table create a delta table out of it and then on top of that you can apply acid properties so this is more or less module 1 okay now let's talk about a little bit about security that is there in your lake houses okay so if i have to talk about security i'll show it to you all directly okay rather than talking about it i will show it to you so the first security that is there okay uh, and we'll talk security in terms of the entire fabric that is there so if i'm talking about the security so the first thing that you can do is that you don't give people okay the, it is in the hands of the admin okay the administrator let me make it clear he or she has a maximum level of security he or she can decide who to give access whom not to give access to the microsoft fabric portal okay it is in their hands sadly i'm not the admin so i can't do that i can't configure who to give access and all okay but the admin has given me the right to create a workspace and to the workspace i am the admin so one way of configuring the security is that you either give access to the entire workspace okay so now what do i mean by that there are four ways in which you can manage access to the workspace so if you come to the workspace you have these three dots if you click on it you see you have this option of manage access you click on it you are you see so now since i told you my uh, my organization is following the approach of the retail company a so anyone within my organization i can give access to this workspace 
okay whether they are from the marketing department they are from the sales department doesn't matter i can give them access to the entire workspace so since archie is a part of my organization all i have to do is type her name okay and if you see since we are on the same domain name since we are a part of the organization so we are a tenant of the microsoft fabric okay i can give her access to the entire workspace now there are four ways in which you can give access one is admin i can make her the admin that means she will have the full uh, access i mean the higher responsibility okay she will have entire access whatever she wants to do she can do uh, upload data create data allow people to allow other people to come into the workspace and access my data access my work okay she gets that right also so that is what is an admin then you have the member where you can do other th you can do all of the things but you can't add new people or re remove new people okay you can't do that particular thing on a workspace the other thing is the contributor they can just contribute to that okay and the last and the final one is a viewer which is similar to just reading the data but they can't upload anything add new people share things with people okay they can't do that in the workspace so this is a workspace level security permissions that you can apply okay the other way in which you can secure your data or provide access is that you go item wise okay you go item wise so if i have to go item wise let's say i want to give archie just access to this notebook i can do that by clicking on these three dots and if you see here you have the option of manage permissions so if you click on this there are two ways in which again in this you can give access one is you either create like a like how we create a one drive link and uh, you share that link with that person once once they click on that link they will be able to open the particular item right or the particular document the other way is you either give direct access to the notebook okay there will be no link created okay like a copy link or anything so if you see here your i say archie okay so what will happen a link will go to her like a shareable link we go to her or you can just create a copy link and you can share it with her so a direct link will go to her or she can just come here and directly access the this thing so i can just give her the access over here. configure these settings let's just say she'll get editing options just say grant and she will be able to just come and edit the notebook directly instead of instead i sending her the link through the mail and then she getting a copy link and then opening that link and etc skipping all that part she can just come here directly and access the notebook so this is how you can grant item wise access you can grant workspace wise access okay rest all access is determined by your fabric administrator that is there zero trust and all uh, it you have to consider that that will have to be considered yeah it has to be then you'll have to put it into purview or something the zero trust i don't think so. no you can it is nothing but zero trust only no it is in the hands of the administrator again sadly i'm not the administrator fabric administrator i'm a part of the tenant so the administrator will decide who to trust and who not to trust this is i am talking in terms of workspace and all the administrator your administrator who will whoever has the access to the microsoft fabric portal will decide who to give access and not based on our 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 that probably he will apply multi factor authentication all those things will then come into picture it's sadly not in my hand so i can't show you that okay it is in the hands of your fabric administrator so your fabric administrator is the one who is responsible and can apply all those things similar to your m365 exactly the same way as m365 is this clear so these are some of the ways in which you can configure whatever is in your hand 
you can configure the security or manage the permissions that are there. Okay, so this is what it is this. So I'll just quickly navigate through the presentation and then we'll take a lunch break. So overall security, I told you, it is basically in the hands of your fabric administrator, similar to the administrator of your Microsoft IDs or email IDs, organization ID. Okay, so he or she decides so they can give you access. If you are a workspace admin, okay, you decide whom to give what access. So this is what we had seen. Okay, then item wise, this is also what I showed you. Either a link you can directly send or you can give a direct access. And then, of course, you can do role based and all of that. Okay, you have roles that you can give to the workspace. If you recall, there is admin, member, contributor, and viewer. Okay, and uh, if you want to go item wise, you need to be a part of the organization without which you will not be able to share. But if I have to talk about fabric as a whole, the entire uh, security okay is in the hands of your so this is how it will look it is in the hands of your fabric administrator so your administrator can decide when you any of these things okay this is how it is conditional access he can apply he can apply mfa okay but sadly it's not in my hand so i, I couldn't show you that so this is fabric security as a whole okay so let's do one thing now. Let's take a lunch break of one hour. And this is the lake house aspect that we have finished. Okay. We have completed the lake house aspect. In the next mod, in the next part, we are going to see a little more about the lake house. And then we will start with uh, the next two modules that is on data warehouse and power VR. Okay, simple things of Power BI. I'm just going to brush through it because uh, it is a lot to teach and it will not be possible in the time span that we have. Okay, so let's make our lunch break and just set the timer.
Hello, everyone. I hope you all are back. Please put a yes if you all are back. Okay, so let's start with the next module. So we have completed module one up till now, where we saw or talked about the lake houses. In this particular module, now we are going to see how can you work with the data factory experience of Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just show a demo. Okay, it's very easy. All the concepts and everything I've explained, I'll just talk about. Uh, what 